the south of Italy, 9th century BC. Considered by the ancients to be a paradise on earth, southern Italy was the theater for an event that was destined to change the history of Western civilization. It all began here, at the Delphi Sanctuary in Greece. In a cave at the foot of Mount Parnassus, a group of citizens arrived from the island of Euboea, off the coast of Athens. They had left their homeland in search of more fertile lands to colonize. But why come here? What did they hope to find at Delphi? Was it a blessing from the god, Apollo? Apollo had both positive and negative sides, a strange, difficult, and sometimes dangerous god. But they needed his help. They were about to brave an uncharted and stormy sea that they hoped led to the promised land, which for the Greeks of 2,000 years ago was called Italy. For more than a thousand years, millions of people traveled to Delphi to seek answers from the Oracle of Apollo. His advice was especially sought by colonists setting off to discover new lands. First, there were the uncharted and perhaps dangerous waters that they intended to cross. And second, was simply the religious and spiritual importance of the sanctuary at Delphi at that time. Standing almost 2,000 feet above the sea, between the Gulf of Corinth and Mount Parnassus. Delphi was the Greek or Hellenic world's most famous sanctuary. Some of the greatest masterpieces of Greek art were concentrated around the temple. Today, all that is left of the statues that once adorned the sanctuary are their bases. They were colossal sculptures made of very expensive materials, and there were thousands of them. The sight of them heightened the pilgrims' expectations. There was the bronze bull, donated by the inhabitants of the island of Corfu in 480 BC. This was in honor of a bull who dove into the sea, leading fishermen to a great catch of tuna. And the splendid bronze copy of the celebrated Trojan horse, donated by the inhabitants of Argos in thanks for the spoils of war from a victory over the Spartans. But the centerpiece of the sanctuary was the Temple of Apollo, the god that oversees all beginnings, the protector of order and harmony. For those who made the pilgrimage to Delphi in search of answers, the temple was an impressive sight. It had six columns made of tuff along its front and 15 on each side. The frontons were faced with marble. In the pronaos or portico in front of the cella, famous maxims were inscribed on the columns such as, all things in moderation, and know thyself, phrases which capture the deepest essence of Greek wisdom. But it was the words of Apollo, transmitted through his oracle, that resonated most deeply with the Greeks. The oracle's predictions were transmitted through the frenzied words of an old priestess who interpreted the answers of the god. In a cave, the faithful awaited the response from the priestess, who, in a state of trance, recited prophetic words regarding the route to follow and where they should land. By following these directions, and probably those of sailors as well, the first Greeks reached the shores of the island of Ischia in the Gulf of Naples about 2,800 years ago. This marked the beginning of the Greek colonization of southern Italy, a vast territory given the name of Magna Graecia, which in Latin means Great Greece, but what was Magna Graecia? Basically, a group of polis, or city-states, whose wealth and power would soon exceed that of the Greek cities of the motherland. For the Greek settlers, 
used to the searing sun, aridness, and mountains of their homeland, Italy was a true paradise on earth, with its mild climate, abundant watercourses, and fertile plains. From the first cities sprang more. The inhabitants of Sybaris, founded by Peloponnesian Greeks, built Poseidonia, now Pestum. The people of Cumae, originally founded by Greeks from the island of Euboea, created Parthenope, which was to become the Athens of the West and is now known as Naples. Many of the residents of Naples are thus of Greek origin, direct descendants of those early settlers from Euboea. Naples is the commercial and cultural heart of the Mezzogiorno, Italy's south, the promised land of the ancient Greeks. Excavations for the new subway line through the center of Naples have turned out to be a window on the city's past. Work in such sites as Piazza Municipio has uncovered not only the old Aragonese walls, but also provided a chance to view a much deeper cross-section of the city's historical layers. Archaeologists from the Naples Monuments and Fine Arts Service have found numerous objects of Greek origin, such as the small fragment of an Attica vase dating back to the 4th century BC, decorated with the figure of an owl. Naples remained a Greek city for many centuries, even during the domain of the Roman Empire. The Romans were fascinated by Greek culture, and for them, Naples represented Greece, only 120 miles from their home, an open door to the allure and refinement of the Orient. Along the hills of Pozzolipo, a name taken from the Greek Pozzolipon, meaning the place where one's troubles end and rest can be found, the wealthy Romans built dozens of beautiful villas. Wanting to blend in, the Romans were happy to exchange their togas for the Greek pallium, to converse in Greek, listen to Greek music, and commission copies of Greek works of art. But Naples was not just a tourist attraction, a sort of amusement park for the Romans. The city was a capital of culture in its own right, where one could be born, live and die in the manner of the Greeks, as Virgil liked to say. And it was here in Naples that the great author of epics wrote the Aeneid. Reproductions of masterpieces of Greek sculpture were much sought after, a big business at the time. Thousands of masterpieces from the Parthenopian school flooded the world, a veritable legacy of Greek art. The rich Romans paid, and paid quite well, to have imitations of famous works of art grace their villas and gardens. Another aspect of Greek culture the Romans appreciated was theater. To stand on the stage of the Naples Theater was the dream of every artist, the consecration of a life, a yardstick of success. The ruins of the Naples Theater have been found buried under later constructions. If you go down into the basements of private residences now standing on the spot, you can discover what remains of the theater made famous partly because it was the site of an exceptional premier appearance. The Emperor Nero himself made his debut as a poet in this theater. Nero loved both poetry and music and performed many times on this stage before an audience whom he spoke with in Greek. Not far from the theater is a section of Naples named for the Virgins. Here, hidden behind this door, several yards underground, is a veritable treasure, a Greek hypogeum from the third century BC. Hypogea were large subterranean chambers having the dual function of being a burial ground and a sanctuary. It was in the hypogea, for example, where ceremonies were held dedicated to the oriental god Mithra who was worshipped widely in Naples. 
This well-preserved one, the Cristallini Hypogeum, was built outside the city walls in an area that in ancient times was nothing but forests and fields. Everything here evokes Naples' ancient past, even though it is quite probable that the bones and skulls date back only to the 17th century, the period of the Great Plague during the Spanish rule. The discovery of the chamber only 100 years ago amazed archaeologists with its finely conserved state. There are votive edicula and delicately frescoed walls with figures still glowing in bright colors and funerary urns for the mortal remains of the deceased. But what is perhaps most striking are the touching farewells to the departed, written in Greek on the walls. Here, a father addressed his daughter, Aristagoras, with touching simplicity. Goodbye, my beloved daughter. In the central part of the city is the spacious Agora. This plaza was the center of the social life of the city and the site of its market. It is incredible, but shops like these under the arcades have been here for over 2,000 years. And it is amazing to note that these narrow streets all have the same width, about 10 feet, and are spaced at regular intervals of 115 feet. The explanation given by archaeologists is that the modern-day streets still follow more or less exactly the Greek streets that were laid out when the city was founded 2,500 years ago. An example is the present-day Via Tribunali, which follows one of the two principal axes of the Greek city and is one of the few broad avenues in Naples. The Agora is also famous for its magnificent temples. The Church of San Paolo Maggiore is the classic example of a Christian edifice standing on the ruins of a pagan temple. The ancient temple was dedicated to the Dioscuri, Zeus's twin sons, who were doomed to live and die on alternating days. Only these two beautiful Corinthian columns remain. But when it was new, the temple existed on a grandiose scale. We can once again view the great temple as it appeared almost 2,000 years ago. Thanks to a Greek inscription found nearby, it turns out that the temple was restored in the first century AD during the reign of the emperor Tiberius at the expense of two rich liberty, freed slaves who had become administrators of the imperial family's wealth. Through recent studies that established the ancient route of the perimeter walls, archaeologists now have a view of the entire ancient city of Naples. The city is of modest size, but completely encircled by a mighty defensive system of walls and turrets, fortifications that stood up to Hannibal and his elephants during the Second Punic War. Yes, even Hannibal paid a visit to Naples. From the top of the walls, you could have witnessed the dramatic events recounted by the Roman historian Titus Livy that took place in the area near the present-day Piazza Dante in the heart of Naples. Livy wrote, The cavalry of the Neapolitan army succeeded with rapid sorties to sow confusion in the enemy ranks and thus forced Hannibal to abandon his siege. Walking through the streets of modern-day Naples, you can see traces in the features and gazes of the Neapolitans of the incredible mix of races that marked this corner of the Magna Graecia during the Hellenic and Roman period. Egyptians, Romans, Italians, Illyrians, and Africans were all accepted within the city walls into the community founded by the Greeks, an exemplary demonstration of tolerance. Naples was only one of many Greek cities in Italy. Pestum, 60 miles to the south, was the location of a very important Greek sanctuary. We don't know exactly when Pestum was founded, but it certainly dates back to at least 600 years before the birth of Christ and was founded by settlers from Sybaris, another city of Magna Graecia. 
Pestum's importance in antiquity is evidenced by these walls that surrounded the inhabited areas. But the best testimony to its wealth are the great temples of the sanctuary, built in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. At that time, Pestum was known as Poseidonia, the Greek name for the city, in homage to the sea god Poseidon. This temple, improperly called a basilica by the early scholars, is the oldest one. It was dedicated to the goddess Hera, a divinity who was venerated as the goddess of fertility and maternity, and who would watch over women when they were about to give birth. The temple has 50 well-preserved columns that taper towards the top. The capitals and the temple decoration in general are in Doric style. About 100 years after the construction of the basilica, the inhabitants of Pestum built the so-called Temple of Poseidon in the immediate vicinity. Actually, we do not know to whom the temple was dedicated, but it is one of the best preserved of Magna Graecia. It had symmetrical fronts with six columns along each shorter side and 14 columns along each longer one. The complex of the two temples comprised the sacred area. At the time, the sight of the two stone giants shining in the sunlight must have been a view of rare beauty. Another great temple of the city is the one dedicated to the goddess Athena. This temple is quite original to the expert's eye, since its external columns were Doric, while the columns and capitals around the cella, currently displayed in the Museum of Pestum, were Ionic. For modern scholars, this is the first known case of two different architectonic orders used in the same building. During medieval times, the temple was converted into a Christian church, as demonstrated by the tombs found inside. In the Forum lies the so-called Italic Temple, or Capitolium, the first temple built by the Romans after the year 273 BC, when Poseidonia came under their domain and took the name of Pestum. This temple was rather exotic, starting with its high base, a lot different than those of the Greek temples. It was dedicated to the triad of divinities honored on the Capitoline Hill in Rome, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. At the turn of the first and second centuries AD, the temple occupied a part of the stairways of a pre-existing structure, the area of the Comitium, where the city assembly met in the open air. The area was packed with monuments, and in the distance was the great bulk of the amphitheater. Sacred rites in these temples were carried out under strict guidelines. Inside of the temple dedicated to the goddess Hera, for example, we find a large cella with three naves and a bi-level colonnade. But in ancient times, it was only the priests and initiates who were allowed to walk down the colonnade and enter religious buildings. Others would have to stop in the pronaos in front of the entrance. Every morning, the priests purified the cellar with holy water and made offerings of food and drink to the large statue of the goddess. The door was the only opening in the cellar. The wooden ceiling and the imposing statue of the goddess must have filled the hearts of the priests with an indescribably mystical sensation. The temples at Pestum have always fascinated the numerous people who visit them. In the 18th and 19th centuries, famous celebrities such as the archaeologist and art historian Winkelmann and the poets Goethe and Shelley would come to Italy on their grand tour as a kind of pilgrimage in search of beauty. Another fascinating Greek site not far from Naples is a small fishing village known as Potswili. In ancient times, it was called Dikearchia, which in Greek means city of justice. 
It was founded in 529 BC by refugees from the island of Samos, including the philosopher Pythagoras, who were fleeing the tyranny of Polycrates. The liberty they won was relatively short-lived. In 190 BC, a Roman colony was instituted on the ruins here that took the name of Puteoli, later becoming Pozzuoli. On the promontory, the ancient acropolis of the city, the Romans built a large temple during the Augustan period. The temple was revealed again recently after a fire destroyed the church of San Proculo in 1963. Pozzuoli was the most important port in the empire for descendants of the Greeks, Rome's true gateway to the sea. There were docks here for large cargo ships that transported goods all over the empire. Today, nothing remains of the ancient piers, only a 19th century print that gives us a glimpse of its 15 arches. The economic and commercial importance of the city is evidenced by the Macellum, the market, second in size and variety of services only to that in Rome. The Macellum was also known as the Temple of Serapis, after the Greek divinity and patron of markets. In 1750, excavations in the Macellum were ordered by the King of Naples, Charles IV of the Bourbon dynasty. They immediately encountered a small mystery. The columns were pocked up to a certain height with strange and irregular holes. Studies showed that the holes were related to the phenomenon known as Bradyseaism, the rising and falling of the Phlegrean coast with respect to the sea. The temple was thus at times submerged by the sea, and when it rose again it was marked by these holes made by mollusks known as lithophaga. The Macellum comprised a large rectangular portico, measuring 190 by 245 feet and enclosing the shops. It was an impressive and bustling marketplace. At the center of the internal courtyard, there was a round building, the Tolos, decorated with marble sculptures and statues. The market was a riot of Mediterranean colors, a meeting place for many different peoples and languages, from Egyptian and Phoenician to Greek and Latin. On display were exotic products, spices, perfumes, ointments, Greek and Egyptian antiques, and naturally, a wide variety of products from the sea. In 1700, in the large apse behind the Tholos, archeologists found a statue of Serapis, after whom the entire complex was named. Not far from Pottswilly, in another part of the Phlegrean fields, is the beautiful and unsettling Solfatara, the best known volcanic crater in the Phlegrean area. The volcano has been dormant for at least 2,000 years, but its characteristic phenomena are still visible today. There are few places where one has the clear impression of the phrase, fire in the belly of the earth. Tradition has it that giants were chained here after being defeated in a bitter fight with almighty Jupiter. The Phlegrean fields, according to this ancient myth, are unstable because of the agitated, convulsive movements of these giants. Another area related to myths about the underworld is the nearby Lake of Averno. The door to Hades was said to be found on its shores blanketed in ancient times with a thick forest. According to Virgil, the Sibyl's cave was also here, where both Aeneas and Ulysses went to begin their journeys into the underworld. The Magna Graecia was a home to people who not only loved literature and art, music and poetry, architecture and drama, but who appreciated the lush landscape, the open seas, 
and the tantalizing mythology that came with the territory. For gods and goddesses, and sailors and warriors who came home from the sea, Magna Grecia was almost heaven on earth, an enchanting land, combining a nobility that was all Greece on a palette of exceptional beauty. The Mediterranean Sea, 4th century BC. In every era, people of different ethnic groups have migrated in search of new land to lay the foundations of new civilizations. Sicily, a fertile and welcoming island, was the site of massive migration. The Phoenicians were the first to set up trading posts here that later grew into cities. However, they only considered the island a convenient landing place. Starting from the 8th century BC, the island that was so inviting and rich with water and pastures attracted the attention of another people, the Greeks, who emigrated there in great numbers. In a few centuries, there were such large colonies on the island that Sicily had a larger population than Greece itself. Archaeological excavations in Sicily revealed cities with more temples than were ever seen in Greece. Come with us as we explore the dramatic history of the largest island in the Mediterranean Sea. Greek historian Herodotus wrote that Greece had a faithful friend in poverty. It's a strange thing to say about a land that was considered glorious, proud, undefeatable, elegant, and cultured. Yet, that's how things were. Many Greeks earned their livelihood through trade, others with fine crafts. But the dry, stony, barren, and infertile Greek soil produced very little. From the 8th century BC, the Greeks started emigrating, mostly to the west, toward Italy and Sicily, a very fertile land, and in an ideal position for trade, since it was in the middle of the Mediterranean sea lanes. While excavating on Sicily, archaeologists realized that around the middle of the 4th century BC, many cities expanded into new quarters, often far from the coast. They found numerous buildings in the interior of the countryside. What was the cause of this population explosion and shift in locations? By consulting ancient historical texts, especially those written by Plutarch, scholars came across a very important event. In 339 BC, the Greek colonies on Sicily defeated the Phoenician colonies in the west in a memorable war at Hemera. They thereby laid the foundations of their supremacy on the island and beseeched their homeland for strong men to thoroughly colonize Sicily. One of the puzzles that has long been debated among archaeologists is the nature of the first Greek colonies on Sicily. Were the first settlers, the pioneers who came to Sicily, peaceful explorers who lived in harmony with the local inhabitants, the so-called Sicanians, or did they forcefully take control of the best land on the island? According to the accounts of ancient historians, the Greeks were belligerent people, 
unlike the Phoenicians who also settled on the island, although only for trade purposes. Greek settlers were described as being intent on owning arable land. While the Phoenicians built emporiums along the coast and were not interested in the interior, the Greeks tended to expand and take military control over vast areas. Ortigia is a small island adjacent to Sicily and the first settlement of what would become the largest Sicilian colony of ancient times, Syracuse. Excavations under the present-day cathedral there, which incorporated the Greek temple of Athena, led to the discovery of an ancient indigenous colony that was supplanted in the 8th century BC by a Greek colony. Archaeologists were able to pinpoint the date after studying the type of pottery they found. Studies revealed that Greek settlers had driven out the native Sicanian peoples, conquered the city of Syracuse, and expanded beyond Ortigia into the mainland. The building boom the Greeks initiated may be found to this day in the still existing quarries that the Greeks later used to lock up prisoners of war. But people weren't constantly at war on Sicily. There were long peaceful periods during which Greek settlers exchanged products and compared their artwork with Phoenician settlers and the Sicanians, thereby keeping the island humming with prolific cultural exchange. Syracuse, in the fourth century BC, was an enormous city with mighty fortresses and numerous monuments that were elegantly decorated. Among the most famous pieces is a Gorgon mask and the Venus Landolina. Across the canal on the mainland was the second part of the city, a city that had become the largest and most important in Sicily. Excavating here, in what is presumed to be the more recent quarters of the city, archaeologists came across a theater. Strange inscriptions engraved in stone appeared at various points. Translators soon realized that all those graffiti had something in common. They were names of gods and famous kings. But what was the relationship between them? Systematic excavation of the theater and reliefs revealed a strange symmetry between the points in which the inscriptions were found, which led them to unravel the mystery. The names had been engraved to distinguish the theater's various sections and seating arrangements. It was here that the premiere of one of the most representative dramas of Greek culture the Persians by Aeschylus was held. The play is about the great victory of the Greek city-states, united for once, over the militarily strong Persians, whom the Greeks defined as barbaric and lacking culture. The premiere at Syracuse meant that Sicily had become, over time, an integral part of Greece, after all, Aeschylus, like Archimedes, was a Siciliate, a Sicilian Greek, and spent most of his life at this theater. The theater symbolized the presence of Greeks on Sicily. The Phoenicians were primarily devoted to trade and spent little time on literature and the Romans, who arrived later, preferred the oval-shaped amphitheater where they could watch gladiators in action. Perhaps the world's highest concentration of ancient Greek theaters is on Sicily, where culture was associated with wealth. This one, at Tindari, opens toward the sky and gives us a sense of how the Greeks attempted to create dramatic visual impact to intensify the pathos of their tragedies. One of the most spectacular Greek theaters on Sicily 
is undoubtedly the one at Taormina, dug into a promontory overhanging the sea. This one at Catania, at the foot of Mount Etna on the east coast of Sicily, is like a gem perfectly inserted into the city landscape. On the other side of the island was Agrigento, and along the way was a noted latifundium, a great landed estate with a magnificent home, almost a palace, and a rest stop, a so-called Philosophiana Statio. This place for centuries existed only in the pages of an antique guidebook called the Itinerarium Antonini, but eventually it started revealing traces of itself. In the 50s, archaeologists systematically began excavating the ruins, 40 miles from Catania, in the vicinity of Piazza Armerina. They came across a real treasure, the Villa del Casale, an owner's country house containing the largest, richest, and most complex set of late antiquity mosaics that have stood the test of time. Nearby, at a place called Sofiana, Similar treasures were discovered, preserved over the centuries. Archaeologists unearthed some bricks there, stamped with a seal with the word philosoph impressed on it. By joining both words, we get philosophiana, the ancient and wealthy landed estate described in the Itinerarium Antonini. This luxury and this concentration of mosaics, along with the Villa del Casale itself, was typical of the Romans, however, and not the Greeks. The Romans arrived on Sicily after the Greeks, so these finds actually date from the late antiquity period of the fourth century AD. Philosophiana, the estate's name, perhaps originated from the owner's interest in philosophy, or he could have been an aristocrat involved in the circus business or gladiator contests. Perhaps he was a great merchant who traded in exotic animals. One of the largest and most famous mosaics found here is the so-called Great Hunt. The mosaic runs along a corridor measuring an amazing 216 by 16 feet. The same shapes appear in the Zistus, the covered floor of the gymnasium. This other mosaic, found not far away, which modern scholars have called girls in bikinis, has led us to believe that a gymnastic competition was held in the corridor of the Great Hunt. Reaching Agrigento at the other end of the island, we find a valley studded with temples, many of which are miraculously still standing. This one, the Temple of Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri, was rebuilt with original material. Imagine, dozens of temples in a single valley. This great archaeological legacy was not the result of a discovery, it has always been there. Such a concentration of majestic public works has left scholars truly perplexed and not a little mystified. Archaeologists realize that the most important temples, like this one called the Temple of Concordia, or this imposing one, the Temple of Zeus Olympus, decorated with telemonies, gigantic figures used as pillars over 23 feet high, were erected only a few years apart, around the middle of the 5th century BC. Oh. 
Who could have handled such a huge workload in such a short time? And where did all the money come from? Scholars looked for the answer in ancient books by Greek historians Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus. They speak about a tyrant from Agrigento called Theron, who a few years earlier had won a devastating war against the Phoenicians. The victory brought him riches. It also brought him an incredibly large number of slaves, so much so that some inhabitants of Agrigento owned over 500 of them. The slaves were obviously a great help in building a valley full of temples. This is what the Temple of Concordia would have looked like with its original colors in the 4th century BC. In fact, it was incorrectly believed that all Greek temples were white. The Temple of Concordia is a typical temple of the classical period, with six columns on the short sides and 13 on the long sides, surmounted by clean-shaped Doric capitals. Its base, made up of four steps, was designed to overcome the rises and drops in the rocky terrain. The poet Pindar said that Agrigento was the most beautiful city of mortals, and certainly the temples were its Doric glories. In a tranquil setting not far away, at Selenunte, also known as Salinas, one can find three temples in a row erected on level ground. They are ancient and majestic, and identified simply by letters of the alphabet, E, F, and G. Very little is known about them. The ruins of the most imposing one, Temple G, have given archaeologists a real mystery to unravel. The columns, ruined at the base, are partly smooth and partly fluted. Although the different styles were both used by the Greeks, in no temple were both styles used together. Archaeologists wondered about the reason for this mixture. It was certainly not for aesthetic reasons, since classical Greek art was based on stylistic consistency. They compared the design with building techniques used in those times. We know that columns were assembled in blocks, the so-called drums, one on top of the other, until they reached the capital, and only then fluted. Therefore, the column of Temple G may have been unfinished. But why was it never finished? Scholars found the answer in some diplomatic treaties between the Greeks and Phoenicians. Although Selenunte remained a Greek city, it came under Phoenician influence around 409 BC. That date marked a watershed in its history. In order to conquer Selenunte, the Phoenicians attacked it with overwhelming force and destroyed many of its monuments. Most likely, Temple G, still needing its final touches, was destroyed at that time. When the temples were standing in their full glory, however, they were a grand sight. Temple G was perfectly aligned with Temple E. The sacred complex that included a third temple called Temple F was erected on the city's eastern hill. Temple G was the largest of the three and measured 370 feet on the long sides and 177 feet on the short sides. Although this temple was built in the distant past, in the 6th century BC, it was one of the most regal of the Greek world and soared to nearly 100 feet in height. The size of Temple G, the city's pride, can be inferred by its columns, which themselves are almost 56 feet high. Their abacus, the square part of the capital that rests on the architrave, 
extended for an amazing 172 square feet. The majestic Temple G demonstrates the importance of the city of Selenunte, founded as a colony of another city called Megara Hyblia. However, Selenunte was developed more because of its two seaports. The wealth of the city encouraged a certain degree of sophistication in its architecture. This temple is truly one of a kind. You realize it when you enter the nave. The space inside, the heart of the temple, is strangely uncovered. Archaeologists wondered whether this temple had some function other than religious. Its grand size and importance seemed to suggest it. After studying an inscription found there, they figured out that it may have contained the treasury of Selenunte, like the main temples of other Sicilian cities. The central nave was arranged on two levels. The upper level, accessed by two side staircases, was not open to worshippers. Besides aesthetics, it had a more practical function. It was used for the routine upkeep of this high structure, particularly the colossal wooden trusses that supported the roof. The temple's cella housed the statue of the god, probably Apollo, or perhaps Zeus. Among the ruins, archaeologists discovered only a headless bust, so the discussion remains open. The Acropolis, the highest part of the city, was where the well-preserved Temple C was located. The new Phoenician quarters were built in the vicinity of the Acropolis after Selenunte had come under their control. But the Greeks had decided to stay. And the Elimi, an indigenous population from nearby Segesta, later frequented the city. They often fought with the inhabitants of Selenunte, but at times also collaborated with them. In this connection, Greek historian Thucydides recalls the signing of a treaty between the two peoples that allowed them to intermarry. Thus, more than in any other place on Sicily, on this Acropolis, one could perceive that mixture of races and variety of backgrounds that make a culture great. Sicily. Its trade, riches, and elegant buildings made it the beating heart of Magna Graecia. Sicily, bridging continents and civilizations. A fertile and colorful land where long after Homer's time, the Greeks still believed the cattle of the sun gods roamed the hills. Sicily, a land coveted by many, yet ultimately controlled only by beneficent nature. Sicily, the jewel of the exotic ancient Mediterranean. <laughs>